So without further ado, as I said, welcome to tonight's webinar. We're delighted to have Peter Drobak, a member of the Conduit Director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship and Global Health Expert with us. Um, thank you, Peter, welcome. Great to be back, good to see you, Joe. Hi, everyone. So Peter, I guess probably let's just start with what's happening in the UK today. Um, we have the highest death rate um, announced today. What can we expect to see over the coming days? Starting off with the good news, are you? We can expect yeah, to see. There. We can expect to see uh, more more of the same. Unfortunately, we're at that point. I don't know where whether we're at the peak, but we're seeing we're at sort of the top of that surge um, where our health systems act at or above capacity in London, and we're starting to see that happen more in other parts of the country, particularly the Midlands. Um, we don't know whether we're at the peak, and in, in, in some. You know, some models suggest that that peak may still be about 10 days away. Um, so if you look at the countries that have come before us that have had similar experiences, Spain and Italy um, would, be, would be two good examples. You see how long that kind of really difficult peak period lasts. It's not that there's sort of a couple of days where it gets really bad and then it all kind of tapers off. Um, it, it goes for a while, and, and we're learning more and more that there's this long lag time between when someone gets infected and when they actually um, die in those cases where they do. It's often about a month. So, what that means is that we're a couple of weeks into lockdown, um, and that is probably having some effect in blunting the curve, but we're blunting it from a place where it was going exponential. And so it's still growing, it's just growing more slowly. Uh, so all the things that we've been doing the last couple of weeks are critically important. All those things have been helping, but it doesn't make the news any brighter in the short term. And so then thinking about lockdown, obviously it's kind of three weeks ago, at the end of this week, um, about the UK went into lockdown. Um, obviously the government said that they would address that after three weeks and obviously give us more information. That's kind of up on Monday. Um, given what you said, would you expect to see the lockdown continue and continue for quite a substantial time? Absolutely will continue uh, and, it, and it needs to. We're obviously at a very difficult uh, and, and, and risky place right now. If we were to ease up on these measures, we would see things jump right back up because we're still in a place where there's a lot of active transmission. So it needs to be extended. I can't see a responsible scenario in which it wouldn't be extended um, for some time. How long, I don't know. Uh, and, I, and the government hasn't really revealed plans. I hope they're making plans for sort of how we're gonna get out of lockdown eventually. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting work done on this. And um, you know the, the, the things that I think are important criteria to think about would be first, we have to definitely get past the peak and get to a place where we've had about 14 days, a sustained decline in the number of cases, or in the UK's case, the number of deaths, right? So we have to get over this hump and then have 14 days where they're consistently declining. And so that right there is a month away. Um, other things we need to be ready are we actually have to have um, uh, make sure that our health system is able to cope without all of the crisis measures like the Nightingale Hospital and the emergency volunteers and things like that. We need to have widespread testing capacity and tracing capacity because as we begin to ease off on lockdowns, we need to have the ability to test, 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 and then follow contacts of people who have tested positive and get back to that stuff we should have been doing in the beginning so that we can prevent a further spread. So the short answer is lockdown will continue. I think certainly through the end of April, but honestly, this is going to go, I think it's going to go at least another month from now at something like the same level where it is. And sort of transitioning over to sort of Spain, I mean, Spain again, obviously had a bit of a dire day. Um, should we expect to see sort of Spain get everything under control and Europe get everything under control in the coming weeks? We hope so. The trends in Spain had been encouraging, at least relative to where they were, right? They had seen a flattening and then a decrease in the number of cases as well as in the number of deaths. There was, of course, a big spike in the last day, which is really troubling. Um, Whenever the news is good or bad, one or two days worth of data are um, not very informative. You really need uh, to look at about five days before you can start to call something a trend. There can be weird reporting things. Um, if you look at the curves, the, the daily reporting stuff in the UK, 
every Monday there's always a dip and that just has to do with sort of when and how things are reported and deaths and things like that. So it's a little bit of an anomaly. Um, so we hope that that was a blip and, um, and that, that we will still see a, a sort of sustained decrease. But again, it goes to show how this, this kind of peak time when you're seeing a massive amount of suffering and death and strain on the healthcare system, it's not a quick process, even when you're acting as aggressively as Spain has been the last couple of weeks, that this is going to be a many week period. We can expect the same here in the UK. And similarly, you can link to that, obviously, France today banned or, or yesterday banned all exercise outside, um, again, to kind of try and um, mitigate the kind of spread of the virus. Is that what we should expect to see also in the UK? It's definitely possible that we'll see a further tightening of the lockdown measures. It's worth pointing out here that lockdown is not a binary state, right? It's not like all lockdowns are not created equal. It's not as if you sort of simply turn the switch on and off. Lockdown is really a series of social distancing measures or a package of them. Um, and they can be more or less comprehensive, they can be more or less strict, and they can be more voluntary or more enforced. So if you think about what lockdown looked like in China, according to the reports, they were much stricter, right? Nobody was going out without a pass. Even in Italy, to leave your house, you had to have a pass. You had to have almost a permit to leave your house for any reason at all. Here, we can sort of go out and do whatever you want to do. And hopefully most people are complying, but no one's saying you can't go to the shops, you know, five times a week if you want to, um, or how long you should be out exercising for, or what qualifies as exercise. Um, obviously, the more strict these things are, the more benefit it's going to have from an interrupting transmission standpoint. So if, for example, next week when they do the three-week review, they find the curve is not flattening to kind of their goals or satisfaction. There is the possibility that the government could say, you know, we need to turn the screws a little further and tighten this lockdown. And that could mean things like keeping more people home from work who have been classified as essential, saying that we're going to have some mechanism of regulating this, um, saying no more outdoor exercise. All of those things I think are possible. And I mean, you just mentioned kind of China's um, lockdown policy. Obviously, Wuhan is now completely, you know, free for want of a better word, and people are allowed to now actually leave Wuhan. Um, I know we've talked about it before, but what do you kind of see happening in sort of China? Because this is the kind of first experiment, I guess, in terms of a country being in lockdown, a city being in lockdown, and kind of slowly going back to work in terms of should we see another peak in the rise in cases? Um, and how will they mitigate that? What do you think we'll, we'll start seeing over there? Yeah, there's some other countries that already sort of came out on the back end of a, of a peak and have been able to relax various social distancing measures, but those places like South Korea and Singapore never had to implement a full lockdown because they were able to contain and suppress their epidemics earlier. So China, as you say, is the first to probably truly remove a kind of lockdown. It happened around the country everywhere except for Hubei province and then just Wuhan um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the news, obviously, uh, on, on Tuesday that the lockdown was officially declared ended was really exciting. Um, and I think think that you can criticize China for early missteps. You can question the veracity of their reporting and some of the figures that they have. Even factoring that in, it's, it's extraordinary the way that they were able to bend the curve and get ahead of this epidemic. Um, it should be noted, I think a couple of takeaways are number one, that that lockdown in Wuhan lasted about eight weeks. Um, uh, you know, give or take, but roughly two months. And um, so I think that might be a helpful gauge as we start to think about how long are we going to be stuck in this phase of things. We're two and a half weeks in, I believe. Um, time is a flat circle, so I get my weeks mixed up, but I think about two and a half weeks, we still have a long ways to go. Second thing is lockdown ending does not mean you're automatically going back to normal life. Um, China has been experimenting with very careful easing of restrictions and reopening of the economy. Um, so lots of things that people are watching closely happening in China and South Korea elsewhere about how you actually do this stuff. So having the surveillance for testing and, and, and tracing and isolation that I already mentioned is important. They've been um, experimenting with looking at measuring potential immunity through antibody tests to figure out who might have some immunity and might be safer to go back to work. Um, and they've been doing other kinds of permitting and things to, to say, we're not going from, again, 
full lockdown to full normality, we're going to gradually ease some of these restrictions and always be monitoring it um, uh, to see whether we can do this, this safely. No one's ever done this before, right? No one ever had to have a lockdown to this sort of extent uh, for any reason since at least 1918. And so we just don't know exactly what it's going to take to do this. So I hope, you know, we ignored we ignored the warning signs um, coming out of Asia early on in January and February. We also ignored some of the important success stories and lessons coming out of there early on. I hope that we're paying really close attention to what's happening there now because it's going to help inform what we can do in the months to come. And a question in from one of our uh, members tuning in. Have you heard any info about whether the quantity manufactured of high quality PPE for healthcare professionals and others has been substantially increased? Do you have a view as to when there will be enough supply, at least for frontline healthcare workers? It is being substantially increased. Um, and, you know, if you look around, you see it in lots of different ways. So there are lots of companies, manufacturing companies that never made PPE that are making PPE. There have been all kinds of, you know, 3D printer masks and this and that. These are not all industry standard um, PPE, but, um, uh, you know, people are getting creative about it. Um, there was just a report that California had secured 200 million masks for its health workers um, earlier today, um, which is quite exciting. So the, the, the stocks are increasing for a variety of reasons. One of the most important things actually is China opening back up because as you know, China makes most of the world's stuff. Um, and so the fact that they're able to now ramp up manufacturing capacity is hopefully going to loosen these bottlenecks. The challenge is our demand is massive uh, and we have to think about this in the entire world, right? So we know if there are shortages in London, in New York City, imagine the situation in um, you know, for community health workers who are on the front lines in, in Liberia, um, you know, they're going to be, you know, at the, at the end of the line, I think, for, for access there. So there's, it's definitely improving. There are still significant shortages and there's still a long ways to go. And in terms of, I mean, right now in the news, there tends to be a, a lot about sort of the spread of the coronavirus in Western countries. Um, you know, India, I mean, at least I haven't seen it for a few days, has been out of the news. What are we seeing in some of the sort of more global South developing countries and, and more vulnerable populations? Generally, what we're seeing is that um, many are in lockdown. So across sub-Saharan Africa, most countries are in some form of, uh, of lockdown. Some are doing better than others. Um, we're still early in the epidemic curve and um, and our intelligence is really limited by um, difficulties with testing. They want to test unlike the UK, um, but have had limited access to do so. And so keeping up with that has been hard. Um, so we worry that there's more transmission than we're able to capture by, um, by limited testing. Um, so that's a real challenge. The other thing that's a real challenge in a lot of those settings is that the the there's the there's the kind of make the cure not worse than the disease sort of tension and i think a little bit it's a little bit of a false choice but the the reality is the consequences of lockdown are real especially for the most vulnerable families and so um i, I think there's real risk that we're going to start to see more um unrest amongst folks who are just living on the margins who can't just be expected to stay home and not go out and not um, be able to do anything to uh, put a meal on the table for their families um, some countries like rwanda have um, been trying to provide food support um, botswana is doing it as well to try to mitigate this in other places like zimbabwe we've already started to see some protests and some small scale kind of riots i worry that that's going to worsen over time um, so it's been slow to come and I don't think there's going to be any kind of climate, you know, warm weather protection. We've talked about whether the younger demographic is going to be a protection. We can hope that some of that stuff is the case, but I think the reality is this is still sweeping across the world. And um, we, I, I would guess a month from now, the big story is going to be we're kind of past the worst of it in a lot of Western countries, but that um, a, a lot of poorer countries in the Southern Hemisphere are going to be um, in a really tough place. Um, on Monday, our guest uh, speaker on our COVID briefing was Ari Johnson from um, uh, Muso Health. And he was fantastic in terms of thinking about kind of the future of community healthcare workers and how that strategy, which in general happens to be more of a strategy in, say, Sub Saharan Africa, um, and I know obviously is a big thing in Rwanda and, and where they're working in Mali, 
And we were talking a little bit about what that would mean for kind of a transformation of kind of healthcare systems in um, more sort of Western countries. Um, I'd love your view on whether that's something we should be thinking about, because obviously in many cases, that's a model that really works and means that, you know, it, it's clear that these are the people who have the infections, you can have much greater traceability and actual action straight away. Yeah, it's great that you had Ari. He's, he's, he's so brilliant. He's been a friend and, and, and uh, co-conspirator for a long time, and I've been to Mali um, many times uh, to work with him. Something, something that we've seen, as I'm sure you heard from him throughout our work all over the world, is that having a robust community health worker system that's an integrated part of your health system can give you a level of intelligence that you can't otherwise have. It can also give you a level, a degree of resiliency in the, in the setting of a pandemic or a natural disaster where when the, the 2010 earthquake hit in Haiti, we didn't have any patients miss a dose of their antiretrovirals, their HIV drugs, because community health workers were out there. Even when clinics were closed and nursing schools were crushed, patients still got what they needed um, during that emergency period. And that was the reason. Uh, so, so this is really important. There's a real opportunity for what's sometimes called reverse innovation here. One really exciting development this week which could be a template for other states and other part of the world came out of Massachusetts. Um, and Partners in Health is the organization that I worked with for a long time where actually Ari and Musso's work grew out of. And um, Partners in Health has partnered with the state of Massachusetts to take their 30 years of experience with community health workers in Haiti and Rwanda and lots of other places and apply that to, to build an army of community contact tracers mm -hmm across the state to help them get out of lockdown and both provide needed care and support to patients, but then also trace all of the context so we can interrupt chains of transmission. So that's an awesome example of how that model is going to be adapted and applied in sort of big American cities. And I think it's going to be really successful. And that's exciting. Um, yeah. So maybe we should move to some good news and then I have some other, uh, other questions that I, I really want to kind of delve into. But what else is positive out there right now? What else is positive out there? Um, uh, let's see. The um, uh, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but a, a human um, COVID vaccine trial is going live here in Oxford, and um, and also the largest sort of multi-center clinical trial for a number of different treatments called the Resolve trial was also launched across the UK. It's being run out of the University of Oxford. Um, so two exciting things that are happening here in that kind of Manhattan project of R&D that's happening for, um, uh, for COVID-19. And so exciting to see that, um, uh, that all the brain power here is, is being applied. Um, the, other, the other development on kind of a treatment front that was pretty exciting to me um, over the earlier part of this week is that this, um, this, this notion of um, serum therapy from recovered patients um, has looks like it's pretty effective. So we've had a couple of the first published reports on this in China. So the idea is this is like a 19th century treatment where you take someone who's been exposed to the infection and recovered and say, well, this person's probably got antibodies. So you take their blood and then you distill out the serum um, in a concentrated way and you inject them or infuse them into a person who's sick with the virus. And you're essentially giving them an infusion of antibodies against the virus. And those could theoretically also be manufactured. But what we know is that we've already got hundreds of thousands of people who have recovered from this virus around the world. And um, so could we start to pool serum and then use that as a treatment? And the answer looks like yes. It's mostly been given so far to patients who are critically ill. So they're in the ICU, they're on a ventilator and they're near death. And so you give them the, the kitchen sink approach. And so you give them this along with a bunch of other stuff. A lot of them got better and a lot of the kind of markers of them being so sick got better. And that's really promising. So now what we need are really controlled trials where you sort of can try to isolate whether this is really the thing that's having an effect trying it in patients who are earlier in their illness to say when somebody starts to get sick, as for example, the prime minister was last week, if they were to get a treatment like that, could it prevent them from progressing to that more severe disease during week two of the illness? The other place it could be really exciting is actually prevention. So if you have say frontline health workers who are going and being exposed to the coronavirus again and again and again and again every day, 
could they have an infusion, say once a week or once every two weeks that might prevent them from getting infected? So all of this is kind of underway, but the early results are pretty promising. And this is something that if it's found to be safe and effective could be scaled relatively quickly. That is exciting news. And I wish I'd kind of saved that to the end because I'm, I'm now going to go back onto more, more negative news, but it's, it's great to hear that these things are kind of spinning out and actually looking pretty successful and um, with the ability to apply them. Um, in terms of kind of disparity in death, so obviously there's been quite a few um, articles in the news this week about just the difference um, in ethnic, eth different ethnicities um, and their reaction to um, the coronavirus and increased deaths in different communities. I just love your thoughts on kind of from the kind of global health um, side of things. Is this something that, I mean, I think it was potentially something that could happen that it could with any viruses that would come out, but sort of what would be your take on this and are there ways in which we should, government should be thinking about um, reacting uh, to this in a different way? Yeah, the, the, we finally started to get some data on this and they're, they're disturbing, not necessarily surprising. One thing we've heard again and again in the in the media are people saying that well this virus doesn't discriminate right and it, what what they mean is that the virus doesn't care about our borders doesn't care about our politics it can affect any of us or all of us so we should all pay attention and sort of be afraid and be vigilant because it's not somebody else's problem it can affect all of us and so yes that's true that the virus doesn't discriminate but we do and our systems do and so what we're seeing is that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting communities of color, uh, and particularly poor communities of color. And so the, this isn't being tracked very well. A lot of people don't report on, for example, race. But from the data we've got, um, just to give you a couple of examples, in, uh, in Chicago, um, which is uh, an emerging sort of hotspot, there have been quite a number of infections there, about a third of the population are African American. Um, 72% of the deaths um, have been among African Americans in more than half of the cases. So this is concentrated in largely poor black communities. We're also seeing early evidence of that being the case in the UK as well with, with uh, you know, BME communities to use the local, uh, local parlance, that, that those communities are facing disproportionate uh, numbers of infections and, and, and also deaths. And the reason for that is almost certainly not biological or genetic. The reason is the structural inequalities that are baked into our systems, our healthcare systems, um, our housing systems, our social and economic systems, et cetera, that's putting them more at risk. And so this is exposing, um, uh, a, you know, a, a big structural inequity and, and hopefully we'll highlight it in ways that will allow us to um, maybe finally start to address it. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like we could have a whole session directly focused directly on structural inequalities and how do we actually tackle them. Um, that's probably, a great idea. probably one to say for another day. Um, yeah. again, although on that topic, I mean, obviously you're, you're from the School Center of Social Entrepreneurship. Are there um, exciting initiatives that you're seeing that are working on kind of these structural inequalities in kind of big cities um, that you would love to see scaled? Starting, we're going to be working a lot more on this and hopefully we can talk about it in the future. Um, Kate Rayworth, who many of you may know, who uh, wrote Donut Economics, has been, it's been in the works for a little while, but she, um, she and her team have partnered with the city of Amsterdam to try to apply the kind of donut economics model, which I can, could talk more about in, in our limited time, but it's basically about an economic model that's not looking for growth at all costs, but trying to provide enough that all humans can be provided for, but not um, so much consumption that it um, uh, overuses the limited resources available we have on the planet. So they're not trying to put that in action at the level of a city in Amsterdam, which will be the first time that that's done. And I think that's a really exciting, um, you know, kind of model for change. You know, I, I sometimes think about, COVID-19 being a dress rehearsal for the climate crisis and a lot of the other big wicked problems that we face. And because they are gonna require, uh, you know, concerted collective action, because these problems transcend any one organization, one nation state, et cetera. They're gonna require a different kind of leadership uh, and, uh, and really a systems approach. So, um, so we're gonna be doing a lot on that. Uh, there's a course I teach in Oxford called Global Opportunities and Threats Oxford, which is about those very things. We're in the process of designing a big open public online version of that where groups of people could get together and essentially take the course for free and use that as a way to take 
um, some element of the building back better after COVID equation and figure out how to be a part of the solution there. And that is looking at how we can build stronger health systems that are more resilient, how we can think about um, new economic systems, how we can rethink our safety nets, et cetera, et cetera. So excited about that. And if you'll allow me to make one more plug, tomorrow we're launching a podcast series called Reimagine, which is essentially looking at all these issues and how looking through the lens of the COVID crisis and how the world is changing, how we can rethink and reimagine solutions to things like climate change and health inequality and education inequality. And Kate Rayworth is among the many, many amazing people that I've been able to talk to and we're really excited about it. So um, check it out, Reimagine, wherever you get your podcasts. Actually, we have recently launched our new uh, Conduit Community Forum. And so on behalf of Peter, we've posted um, the first episode, which is with Paul Farmer, um, up on the Community Forum. So make sure you guys all check that out. And if you haven't figured out how to get onto the Community Forum yet, just make sure you contact membership at theconduit.com um, and you can chat with Peter a bit more around the podcast and what we imagine is all about there. Um, in the remaining minutes that we have, we have a few questions to get through. So... Have you seen any learnings or well-supported hypotheses about how long the increased immunity will last in people who have gotten over their first infection of this coronavirus? Not yet, unfortunately. The first person to ever recover from, uh, from this novel coronavirus infection has only been recovered for about four and a half months. And so it's too early to say it takes about a month to kind of build up antibodies. And so we have not seen any convincing evidence of reinfection anywhere thus far. And so that suggests to us that yes, you do get some immunity from um, being infected with this coronavirus and that immunity seems to last a few months. Beyond that, we just don't know yet. There's all kinds of antibody testing being developed. Some of it, the, the point of care ones that were being touted here in the UK look like they're actually pretty unreliable. Um, so that's gonna be difficult, I think, to, to roll out at a mass scale yet. It's gonna take some time for us to know what we know from other coronaviruses is that with SARS, the immunity was pretty long lasting, um, at least a number of years. With other coronaviruses that cause more common colds, it's much more transient and sometimes just a couple of months. This could be either one of those extremes or anywhere in between. Um, we certainly got to cross our fingers. It's longer, uh, but we just don't know. Talking about Korea, I think Singapore had a very sort of similar process to this. And I mean, you've touched on it um, a bit already in terms of lockdowns being very different by per country and, and different governments obviously being more extreme um, and using their powers more. Um, but one of our members has just mentioned kind of what Korea did. So as far as he can understand from um, relatives there, it seems very effective. So someone who displays symptoms go to, goes to a local health clinic for a test they can be given preliminary treatment that gives their immune system a bit of a boost. If they're tested positive, then the patient and others in the house go into isolation. The government then sends food, financial support, um, financial support, even Netflix subscriptions. Their phone number goes into an app with location tracking. So if someone leaves, authorities can be alerted and people can also see where, that, uh, where those coronavirus concentrations can be. And then obviously once patients are cleared past their test rather than a random time period, they are um, you know, allowed to go out. They're also locked down to buildings or towns, and in some cases, they're done in clusters. Um, is this something the UK could copy? Theoretically. Theoretically, yeah. I mean, you know, we've, we've said before, the, U, the South Korea and the US had their first confirmed case on the same day, and they've gone such different directions. Really important to remember, South Korea never had a lockdown, right? They never had to shut everything down, all businesses, all schools, all churches, all economic activity. They were able to be much more targeted in terms of where and what types of social distancing was done because they responded early and did these things like mass testing. So you're not only getting the people who are really sick, you're getting the people with almost no symptoms and pulling them out of circulation before they infect other people. So that helped them to control it. And they had so much intelligence about where the infection was spreading down to the level of individual households that you can decide that this school needs to be closed for a period of time to prevent further contagion, but we don't have to close all schools necessarily. So this tells us that a lot of what's happening here across Europe, across the US, 
was not inevitable, right? In that, in fact, most of the suffering and deaths we're seeing was arguably avertable and preventable. That's sad and that's hard. And I think there should be some accountability for that in the future. But looking forward, I still think there are really important parts of that model that can be useful to us to get out of this. Because remember, lockdown is not a solution. Lockdown is a way to buy time and save lives so that you can protect the health system from getting overwhelmed, but you can't just take it away and expect everything to be better. We need to have a strategy to get out of lockdown, and a lot of the things that South Korea has done effectively are going to be the ways that we're going to need to do that. So we're going to need to be able to test tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people a day, and we're going to need to have the ability to trace their contacts and support those folks. I hope that planning is happening. I'm getting mixed messages from what I'm seeing and hearing. And certainly here in the UK, the, the government's response has been so muddled with different messengers, it's hard to know for sure. Um, but absolutely, there's a recipe there for um, what our strategy should be to end this lockdown. Um, questions keep flying in, but maybe we'll take this quickly because I think that's a quite relatively quick answer. Do we have any data from North Korea? Um, no such thing as a quick answer with me. Um, very, very little data from North Korea. In fact, I think they're one of the three or so remaining countries that do not have a reported case. Um, but in their case, it's because they don't report things. Um, the assumption would be that given uh, how significant the initial outbreak was in South Korea, that, um, you know, uh, and, and obviously in China, the other side of their border, um, that there's likely to be some there. But we do not, to my knowledge, we do not know. What are the other two countries? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. They're tiny island nations um, that have uh, been able to keep out of this. There were a couple of countries in Africa that until last week had no reported cases. Malawi was one of them, but they now do. Um, I can't remember. I'll have to look it up. Like really obscure countries you might not have even heard of. Like Kiribati, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the very last question. So, um, the letter that's come from the UK government to household reflects a model, let's say call it A, where a co-resident of an infected person is free to go out after 14 days after the infection. But there seems to be evidence, let's call it B, that pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic incubation can be up to 24 days. Therefore, doesn't B make a nonsense of A, and what does this mean for the progress of our lockdown? Yeah, there are a number of things that don't quite make sense when you try to square the science with the recommendations. The other thing is this idea that if you have COVID-like symptoms, A, of course, we're not going to test you, so you don't know if you really have COVID-19 or not, um, you should self-isolate for seven days um, after your symptoms start, even knowing that most people have symptoms that last longer than seven days and, and, and the vast majority also are shedding virus and therefore contagious for 14 days or more. So that period should be much longer. We have government officials like Matt Hancock who came back after seven days. I hope they actually tested him to see whether that was safe to do so. Um, so that's an issue. The fact that if you're sick, you don't get tested and you're locked up at home with the rest of your family members to inevitably infect all of them is an issue. And in a, without widespread testing and isolation, we will never be able to fully tackle this. The, Every week, there's more evidence that pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission is a huge driver of this pandemic. And so unless we're getting ahead of it and finding ways to interrupt that, which can only happen through testing and contact tracing and isolation, um, this is going to continue to just slowly spread. Um, it just makes you wonder whether this is the best we can do. And, and I sometimes wonder whether the, the herd immunity strategy has not actually really gone away. They've just stopped talking about it. Well, on that note, <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. Peter will be back with us next Wednesday. Um, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everybody, for your great questions and for being so engaged this evening. Um, we look forward to seeing you on our webinars tomorrow. But thank you very much, Peter. We'll see you after Easter. Have a great break. Um, and take care, everyone, and have a good evening. Stay safe.